you might say it was dope. I would say it was dope. You know, there's a lot of things in life that are dope. Yeah. Um, including our next speaker, who I believe may perhaps be the single dopest man in infrastructure. Awesome. Please welcome to the stage, Kelsey Hightower. All right. <laughs> You are, in fact, the dopest man in infrastructure. Oh, I am. Yeah. All right. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to leave you alone. I got to get off the stage, but I just, I like you so much. I want to hug you first. Oh. Hi, Kelsey. Mike, Thanks. I love you. Thanks for coming. The beard. I know, right? I don't have one. You could get one. So, like, some of your beard is in my beard now. <laughs> right. We're joined together as beard brothers. Okay. I got to go yeah, brush like, that out. It's like, but, <laughs> it's like bread brothers when you're like, in, okay, I got to go this way. See ya. All right. So, this talk uh, is dedicated to all new users and new speakers. Last night, I decided to be one of those. So typically, I uh, hide in my comfort zone and talk about things I know really, really well. So I decided to learn Habitat last night. <laughs> and I deleted my slides. <laughs> and we're going to talk about Habitat today as a new user. And I'm going to, um, people always ask me, how do you go about learning new things? And I say, well, I typically take something I know and pair it up with something I don't know, right? And then make it work. So that's what I'm going to do today. And really, I'm hoping this inspires some of the new speakers who think they have to be an expert before they can get on stage. That is absolutely false, OK? So we're going to talk about Habitat and Kubernetes. How many people are interested in this topic? I am, so that's all that matters. <laughs> so first thing I started with is the Hello World application in a language that I know. So I wrote an application in Golang, very simple application. I'll just show it to you now. It's a bit of code here, but really what it does is just come up and say Hello World. It also gives me things like version information that includes its host name and so forth. So the goal with this is I just want to run this in my, on my machine to see if it works. So we'll start with that. So I'll say go build, and I'll create a binary on my local machine. So once I have this binary, I'll just run it, and we'll see what we get. Oh, no config file. That's pretty lame. This is what new users go through, so don't be hating. <laughs> That's what I call it. Like, you stop hating on me, OK? I'm, I'm new. right? So we'll do config file, and we'll give it our config file. And we'll give it config.json. So my hello world is up. So I start from a known place. Now, if this works, I should be able to go to my browser over here and see that we're in good shape. Great. Hello, Habitat. <laughs> and that's how you should do new speakers, because hello world isn't impressive, but it is when you're new. OK? 1.0. And then we're going to look at the config option to make sure everything is working right in terms of configs. Great. Oh, that's my laptop host name. I'm pretty sure Google's like, what the hell are you doing? <laughs> so we'll hide that. <laughs> All right, so my app works. So what does Habitat actually do? Habitat is a couple of things to me, and I may be wrong about some of these things. It's a build system, and it's a supervisor that provides some really cool features like configuration management when you're running, and it can also do updates. But in my case, I just want a better build process, so I'm going to start there. Now, normally, when I build an application that's written in Golang, I use a Docker file. How many people have seen a Docker file before? All right, for those that have never seen one, be prepared. This is like rated R. <laughs> Enter. Now, the first thing you do is you bring in the entire operating system. Regardless if you're using the components in there or not, that's just what you do. And then you install Golang from source, and you build it. And then you copy in your 1K application. <laughs> now, the result of this whole output would be about 675 terabytes. <laughs> <laughs> but your app is going to actually run. Okay, So this is what I would normally do. Now, the nice thing is, when I discovered Habitat, is it has a built-in build system. 
So once you start with Habitat, you get this nice little Habitat directory, and it gives you some hints and some great documentation, by the way, so kudos uh, to the documentation folks. Probably the most important people in tech that get no love. So here's my plan file, okay? At least that's what it says. And you do basic packaging stuff. You give things version numbers. You give things the name of your package. But one thing that I thought was super interesting was this bit down here where you say, hey, in order to build my application, I need to go runtime. And looking at the syntax, I'm like, where are you getting go from? I'm not downloading it from anywhere. So I dug a little deeper, and it turns out Habitat feels like a big Linux distro. But the contract doesn't seem to be with the machine. The contract seems to be with your application. So anything you need to build your app or use when your app is running, it feels like Habitat provides the entire stack for me. So I can just bring it into me or into my application and use it from there. So this is a great starting point. So I know that this thing is going to have re reproducibility. And also, I get the benefits of actually getting the security updates from Habitat itself. So this is pretty cool. And then down here, I just do what I'm used to. I just call go build. I know how to do that. And I'm going to just copy the binary into the bin directory. So at this point, I kind of understand this part. And there's some other things that happen in Habitat, like you can do things like template your config files. So remember that config file that I had earlier? One thing that you run into, no matter what system you're using, is eventually you're going to need to do dynamic configuration. So let me clear my screen really quick so you can see uh, what's going on here. So what I want to do is put a placeholder so at runtime, I can actually figure out the max number of Go processes I can have or Go routines that I can have in my application. So this uses a very familiar syntax for substituting values. So this is great. So at runtime, I should be able to do this. So once I get all of that working, now I need to build it. Now, from a UX perspective, Habitat is pretty dope. There's this thing called Hab Studio. And then you can do like Enter. And then you just drop in to a world of awesomeness. <laughs> I can tell the people that built this tool actually use the tool. Because they do all the little things that make it easy for you to actually do things as a new user. So the first thing that they do really well is actually copy in my entire source tree so that any changes I make while I'm learning actually persist once I exit the environment. That's a game changer, because I've seen some really bad workflows when you don't have that. So the next thing you do is you run this build command. I don't know what it does, really, but it seems safe. <laughs> right? Like, stuff's coming from the internet. You trust the internet, right? <laughs> if it's on the internet, it's true and real, OK? So it brings in all of this stuff. I'm looking like nothing's turning red, so that means it must be good. And it's done. So I built my whole Go application using their binary packages, and it's repeatable. All right. But the thing is, I don't actually plan on running the output of this on a virtual machine. I'm all about the containers. I got to run on Kubernetes. I can't go back to work. Having deployed on a VM, people say, Kelsey is a container guy. So I got to get a Docker file out of this. How do I get this as a Docker image? So the next thing I learned was like, this little co uh, command called hab pkg exports docker, like my name. And then it's like, hello, Habitat. If, I, if this works, I'm going to be like, I'm impressed. <laughs> I remembered. So what it's doing now is actually building my application in a context so we can get a Docker file or a Docker image. So it's going to output a Docker image that I can then run on my local machine. And it just does all of this magic because there is a supervisor sitting on top of your application. And it will give you some of these nice things. And we'll see what that looks like in a minute. All right, so now that we have the thing built, what I can do is take this ID and run it under Docker itself. So I'm going to make this a little bit bigger. And we'll say Docker PS. We have some stuff running here which is my studio, so I'll just leave that up and running. But we want to run that application. So we can say docker run. Uh, yeah, we'll just take the latest version of that. And we're just going to run it on my machine. So this is where the demo guys need to help me. 
Docker PS. So what we want to do is verify that things work in the, in the way I think. So I come here, and I should be able to hit this app with this forwarded port on Docker, 127. We come here. Let's see if it took my binary and made a Docker image for me. Woo! It did. <laughs> and the host name is changed to match the context where I'm running. So I know that's looking good. So I'm feeling like a real champ at this point. I'm like calling my mom, like, you should see this Habitat thing. <laughs> should totally download Habitat right now. She didn't. <laughs> so now I got this image. Now I'm in familiar territory. I know what to do with these things. You push them into a repository. Now the nice thing is Habitat's output is going to be about 100 megs mainly because you have a supervisor process, you have your app, and you have a bit of a user land. And for some people, a user land is really good to have in production when you need to debug. You, sometimes you need to have a shell to do some debugging. So you push it up to a repository. Now, you'll notice by default, Habitat puts things out with the Docker default namespace, and you may not want to do that. So what you can do is you can just simply tag uh, all of your images and send them to any repository that you want to. So in this case, I could tag this and say that it should go to my private repository, okay? So you can totally do that and still push these images anywhere you want. You're not getting some new foreign container image. This is just standard stuff. Now once I have that, it's Kubernetes time. Is that a thing? Yeah. So there's a lot here, but I want you to look at this. We live in this declarative world. Just like in Habitat, I declare things. In Kubernetes, we declare things. Habitat doesn't deploy itself. So what I'm doing here is saying, hey, I want to deploy that image from my repository built by Habitat. And it will totally run because the entry point to that container will be the Habitat supervisor, and it knows what to do to bring up my process. And it also has a configuration management element, but the thing is, in Kubernetes, I'm not going to use what Habitat has built in called the consensus ring. Now, I know about consensus ring because I've worked on tools like etcd before. So it's really nice if you're not running in a cluster manager like this to have the ability to negotiate with your peers and pass values around. But Kubernetes already has that. So as one does, I build some Kubernetes integration with Habitat so I can actually have Habitat receive configuration data from Kubernetes and upgrade all of my configs on all of my apps. Okay? So what we're going to do is we're going to deploy this application, but before I do, I'm going to put in my default configuration. So this config file, user.toml, reading the documentation, this is how you override uh, key value pairs inside of Habitat. So what I'm going to do is store this inside of Kubernetes. Okay? So I'll say kubectl git config maps. Now, I said Kubernetes has its own consensus store. So when I write values into Kubernetes, they get stored in a tool called etcd. Very similar uh, consensus ring. Think of it as a global consensus ring. So my toml file is in there. Now I'm going to mount that file up into my application so that it can read it from disk, right? So we'll look at this last thing before we, we deploy this thing. At the bottom here, I'm referencing that config file, and I'm going to inject it into this little tool that I built. I don't know where I found the extra time, but I totally did it. It's on GitHub, and you can totally use it. What this tool does is it reads configs from its disk and watches for changes, and if there's something different, it will ask Habitat to load it by using the built-in consensus protocol that's exposed, and I can just feed it the full TOML file. Now you're going to see why this is important in a moment. So let's deploy this application. So we'll say kubectl git pods, nothing's running, kubectl create-f deployments Habitat. Now what we'll do is just see what's going on here. So we'll just do a watch. Watch kubectl. So kubectl is the command line for Kubernetes. So that's our application. Now, one thing that Habitat doesn't do, it doesn't integrate your app with the load balancer. It does have a scope. So how do we get this IP address from this thing being managed by Habitat into my load balancer? Well, this is where your cluster manager gathers that data, and Kubernetes has built-in service discovery. So here's a little bit of synergy happening. Habitat's managing my app. I'll go configure the network. If you haven't seen this, it's really simple. So kubectl git svc. We have this hello habitat 
endpoint here. And if you look here, behind it is actually doing our service discovery. All right? Bam. So it found the container that's running, so that's one of them. And I can hit this IP, and if it works, I should be able to replace this. Come in on 8080. Uh, I should be able to, right? Let's try that with this. Ha ha! It's running. You should clap for that because that was risky. <laughs> so now here's where the integration with Kubernetes happens. Habitat is doing configuration management for me, right? So what I can do now is say, Kubernetes, you update the config file, and then you give it to Habitat to do its thing. So we'll keep this big here. We see that it's uh, set to five. We want to change that value. Again, everything is declared between these both, system, both of these systems. So what I'm going to do is edit that declaration on the config map. QCTL edits config map ha hello habitat. All right, so I'm going to change it to, uh, let's say, 10, right? We hit save here. Now what's going to happen is habitat, one thing we can do with Kubernetes, we can say, let's look at the logs for that container that's running. So git pods, kubectl logs, and what we want to do is look at the logs for this running app to see what Habitat is doing. So what we'll do is we'll look at the Habitat container, and then we'll look at its logs. Now, you'll see what it did already. It got the new configuration from my helper process, shut down my other process, brought it back up, and regenerated the configuration. This is something that Kubernetes just doesn't do, but Habitat does. So if we switch back over here, we see that we now have 10. Okay? And if I had a million of these things online, you can clap. <laughs> the nice thing about this is you can keep the same Kubernetes workflow and use Habitat together without changing how you understand both tools. That whole sidecar pattern is a great way to prototype. And the fact that Habitat has all these APIs makes it super interesting. One other thing that Habitat has is a health check built in. So the nice thing about Habitat, maybe I don't want to write my own health check endpoints, I can actually use Habitat's built-in health checking. So what that looks like really quickly is this. You can actually say Habitat automatically has a built-in abstraction for doing health checks. This also works for things like MySQL. You can use an exec statement to check MySQL, and the exit code will be surfaced by Habitat uh, up, the, up the stack. So what I should be able to do with this, uh, I'm hoping that it will work. I'm not feeling too confident. Ah, here's a trick. So it's only available inside. So I have to do something like this, kubectl port forward. Uh, oh, I got it. Let's go back here. This is the one running locally, right? So you guys can see what this help check looks like. Nope. Ah, what is the port? Someone tell me. This is the new user thing. Ah, but I'm running under Docker, right? So under Docker, we need to look at the Docker thing. So Docker PS. And as a new speaker, when you run into issues, you've got to handle it like a champ. You don't freak out, <laughs> OK? Because people will watch you and it's like, he's freaking out. <laughs> oh, boom, it worked, OK? So that's the built-in help checking. <laughs> so personally, I found that Habitat is actually pretty valuable, given that all the things that it does, and it has a great API, so I can extend it. So you'll look at this, and you're like, oh, that's that's pretty boring, dude. Like, you, <laughs> you deployed an application. Cool story, bro. <laughs> I know you want to say that. It's all right. So the next thing you want to do is think about you know, updating these things, right? And what I'm doing now is I want to just print out uh, the actual, uh, now i got to write some bash, like, uh, wow, true, oh, no, 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 I can't remember what I need to do. I need something else. Curl, haha. <laughs> History is your friend, OK? Don't be scared to use it. All right, so we have the app running. So Adam talked about we have to move beyond these tools. Like going around and giving everyone command line tools is just a way to probably get people stuck in their workflows. It may not integrate with their workflows. And he made a really good point that you should just be able to ask for things. So what would that look like? We're just in this API-driven world. So if we were able to ask things, let's, let's see what asking things will look like. So currently, 
we have one of these things running. So we're gonna try some stuff here, okay? I need your support. <laughs> okay, Google, talk to Kubernetes. Sure, here is the test version of Kubernetes cluster. Hello, Kelsey. Welcome to ChefConf. Thank you. Looks like you have a large crowd this time. I hope the demo gods are on your side. I hope so too. <laughs> Sorry, I didn't get any response. Okay, Google, talk to Kubernetes. Sure, here is the test version of Kubernetes cluster. Hello, Kelsey. Welcome to ChefConf. Thank you. Looks like you have a large crowd this time. I hope the demo gods are on your side. I hope so too. Is that a DJ? That's what I call a DJ boot. My dream is to one day run on such an awesome machine. I could really use a new habitat. Scale the habitat deployment. How many replicas would you like? 15. 15. Scaling the Hello Habitat deployment to 15. Now we're doing this with zero downtime, okay? So scaling things is also pretty easy. What about in-place updates? Upgrade the habitat deployment. How many replicas would you like? 15? <laughs> scaling the Hello Habitat deployment to 15. Declarative sources stay that way. Update the habitat deployment. How many replicas would you like? Fifteen. <laughs> Scaling the Hello Habitat deployment to fifteen. Update the habitat deployment. What version of the application would you like to deploy? 2.0. Updating the Hello Habitat deployment to version 2.0. Thank you. Okay, I gotta admit, that was pretty dope. And with that, I'd like to end the presentation. Thank you. That was the coolest thing that I have maybe ever seen in like, I'm, I'm, well now I'm 40, uh, and I started working in IT when I was 16, and if you had told me that I would build a piece of software that someone who I thought was incredibly amazing would learn it the day before and then do that, uh, I don't even know what would happen. That was so incredible. Hugs. Kelsey Hightower. <laughs> who does that? Who can do what you do? Kelsey does that. Okay, you don't don't go anywhere. We got oh, we're, we're, we're talking. Gonna, we're, yeah, we're gonna have a chat. We're gonna not go all the way over here though. We're just gonna we're gonna kind of kick it. Okay, here with the okay. People, we kick it. Yeah, because so um, look, there's a bunch of things that I think are amazing about you. Um, it, it, a, you're the only person who uses dope more than I do. Yes, um, I do. Which is incredible. I had a controller once that worked at Chef who didn't know if that was a compliment or not, and so we had this funny moment where she was like, "I don't, I can't deal with it. Like, are you complimenting me or are you saying I'm a heroin addict?" And I was like. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think we don't mean heroin addicts. No, no, um, no, no, we um, don't. We, we super don't. Um, you know, one of the things I, I, I really admire about you is you've made some really great uh, career choices, I think. You've, you've worked for Puppet Labs, you worked for CoreOS, now you're working for Kubernetes. Um, 
How do you think about that arc of your career, and how do you make those choices about what you want to learn next and sort of where you want to go? Because I, I think it's, it's, it's quite the inspiration. Uh, I think there's one thing that I actually learned was helping people. And it sounds cheesy, but I got to a point where I stopped caring about uh, artificial things like Puppet versus Chef, uh, Go versus Ruby. It doesn't really matter. So I usually pick new tech um, if I think it helps me, and also to go super deep so I can actually be helpful to people out in the community. And one thing I've always found is if you make someone else look good, um, you can't help but to shine with them. It's yeah, kind of in my sure. life. How, um, right? Um, another thing that I, 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 I admire, especially watching your interactions with the Kubernetes community, um, is how much work you've done to make that a welcoming and humane place for, for everybody, um, for people of all levels, um, for people uh, who are super experienced, for new people, people of different backgrounds, from different countries, um, I, every possible thing under the sun. How do you think about building those sort of inclusive, meaningful communities uh, and, and making everybody welcome? I know where I come from, right? My first job was at McDonald's, and getting into tech was a career changer. It changed my life. So everyone that shows up into your community, they're probably doing the same thing. So you just treat everyone with respect. And for people that enter tech, this is a, one of the fields that we don't require everyone to have a PhD. It's one of the things that rewards you for being curious. How many people get paid to be curious? And that's, that's our world. It's so good, right? Um, so honestly, just after tech is over, after we leave these jobs, I think we all work at the same company, just different departments. You work at the chef department, I work at the Google department, and we all switch around. And we're gonna eventually be coworkers, if not community members. So just why not be awesome to people? Right, um, you know, one of the things that, uh, that uh, I think is hard in tech is we, it's, it's easy to get to a place where you understand um, that you should uh, make space for people and you should, you should be great to them. Um, and then it's another thing to, in the moment, remember that you're a person who has, who has privilege uh, or, or who maybe uh, hasn't done those things. How do you, how do you go about making sure that, you, that you, you offer that to everybody all the time? Because I, like, I think it's actually kind of difficult to pull off. Is there Ac anything you do? Actions, my Twitter DMs are wide open. Random people DM me and I jump on Google Hangouts with them. I don't check for credentials. I don't check if they're a customer. You just try to solve their problem. You know, you may time box it. I share my prototypes, even the silly ones. Yeah. And I think most people, there's so many people in the world just trying to do a little bit better. And if you can just help them do that, that's more rewarding than anything else I've ever found. So that's just my, my foundation. You know what? And I like being happy. Yeah. There's this incredible tip you gave me yesterday I was trying to lead you for, so uh, I'm just gonna say it. So this is what he told me yesterday that I think really resonated with me, which is if, if what you do in every interaction is make sure that if you get it wrong, you got it wrong in the favor of that person feeling better. Ah, I'll sense. give him this example. When you go to uh, the sponsorship booths and you meet someone at the booth and everyone is biased in some way, don't fool yourself. So you look at this person and you say, this person in your mind is in marketing. That is a very terrible thing to say to someone if they're not in marketing and if they feel have the imposter syndrome and you just crush them. So error on the highest thing ever. Hey, you look like you're the super senior engineer at your company because some people need to hear that, right? And if they are in marketing, give them a compliment on the booth layout and how awesome it was that they got the experience to learn something. That is an individual responsibility. So what you gotta know is you're probably biased in some way own it, don't deny it, and then exercise that and practice. Practice your bias. Don't wait until the moment comes and then you try to figure it out on the fly. We can't even write code right. People are much harder, okay? So I think if you pay attention, you can do that. that was, I thought that was just the best piece of advice I'd heard in years. Thank you so much, Kelsey. That was amazing.